Hello, everybody, and I just want to thank all of you for signing on to our Tech Tuesdays um, workshop here provided by our uh, Valued Chamber member, Scott Gumbar of Nuage Tech. So um, we encourage all of you to take advantage of these workshops. Um, it's the best to be informed. That's the best way we, we can be protected in this age of um, technology and uh, without further ado, I want to toss it right back over to our host and presenter, Scott Gumbar. Hello, everyone. So, yes, we are going to talk today about what seems like it should be very basic, and that is passwords. And, yes, your password probably does suck. I was just having a conversation with somebody on this call. I won't say who it was about the four passwords they use, but... Um, we're going to talk about why that is not a good idea and um, how to protect your identity, your business, your private private life, all of that stuff with just some really basic password hygiene. Um, so it'll be good for everybody to learn what they can do to better protect themselves. But I want to start with a quick question just to get to know everybody. How far away do you live from where you were born? If you could put that in the chat, that would be great. How far away do you live from where you were born? And I'm going to tell you a quick story. <clears throat> so just a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine owns a roofing company here in Connecticut. And um, whenever they put in a proposal for a job, you know, somebody will call them and ask them, can you come and give me a quote? They'll give them a quote. They, if the person accepts the quote, the homeowner, most of the time it's a homeowner, the homeowner accepts the quote, they um, then put half of the proposal down. So in this case, the proposal for the repair was $7,000. So half would be 3,500. The homeowner sent an email to the roofing company asking if they accept Venmo as a form of payment. The roofing company did not reply immediately. And an hour later received another follow-up email from the homeowner again saying, um, never mind, it's we don't we'll, we'll figure out payment a different way. So they, the roofing company never replied, didn't do anything about it. Uh, a few days later, the homeowner called up the roofing company in a panic because they sent $3,500, the deposit required, to a Venmo account that was not the roofing company. Uh, long story short, what happened was somebody was able to gain access to the homeowner's email account and insert themselves into the email conversation about the down payment and for a uh, method of payment, and then sent the second email that I mentioned where they said, never mind, we'll pay a different way. They actually sent it from a different email address. And if, if we compared the two email addresses, the only difference was they put a letter I in the middle of the email address. And if you're scanning really quickly at a longer email address, you might not notice the difference between the two email addresses. And the I is kind of, you know, not as visible if you're scanning, right? And most of us tend to scan when we're reading something. The homeowner, I don't know what the status of the $3,500 is. They sent $3,500 to another account on Venmo. I don't know how Venmo deals with those things. And I do know she filed a dispute. I don't know what the status of that was. But so what ended up happening is her email account was compromised. They may have just guessed the password. They may have socially engineered. We'll, we'll talk about all of these things shortly. But somehow they gained access to her email account, created a second email account to get into the middle of the conversation and make it look like it was coming from that homeowner and then convinced the homeowner to pay them $3,500. This is a homeowner. It's not a business, not really the focus of, of what we're talking about, but a homeowner losing $3,500 is, is pretty significant. You know, that's probably a couple of mortgage payments and some other bills. Um, so you can imagine the, the emotions that would go through that person once they, they assume they're out $3,500. That is what happens when you use weak passwords and don't follow password hygiene um, in business and in, in personal life as well. 
99% of all data breaches could have been prevented with better password policies. So most of the breaches we hear about, you know, we've heard about some pretty big ones this year. There was the solar ones compromised late last year. There was uh, a few other bigger ones in the IT world. There was some, there's quite a few I could show you just, I don't know, four or five just reported within the last two days for healthcare um, where weak passwords or password policies were the cause of, of the breach. The United States CISA, which is the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, says using a single method, single factor method of authentication is bad practice. Single factor method of authentication means you use a username and password and that's it. So if I log into my bank account and only use an email address and a password, that's a single form of authentication. If you log into your email that way, just use you know, your email account and password, that is bad practice. This is according to the federal government this was just released. This has been known for a while, but the federal government just made this statement, I think two weeks ago, three weeks ago. So the US CISA is part of the Department of Homeland Security, to give you an idea. 15 billion stolen passwords are out on the dark web. Um, if you put that into perspective, there is, a little less than 8 billion people on the planet. That means each one of us has two passwords on the dark web. I know I have at least one on the dark web. So if anybody, any of us has been using LinkedIn since prior to two, two, 2015, you have at least one password on the dark web. Um, in 2015, or I don't know if it was 2015 or 2016, but they were breached. Their LinkedIn was breached. The passwords were stolen and everybody's password was in clear text, and it is now sitting on a list in the dark web. And so what happens is somebody can take freely available software easily to obtain, and I have, I have copies of it, and I use it sometimes for, for good reasons, and then uh, download these password lists, run a script against, let's say, wellsfargo.com, and see if any of those passwords work username and password combinations. Or if they say they want, let's say they want to see if they can log into another account using my credentials, they'll take whatever email account I was using on LinkedIn at the time and the password and try those credentials against a bunch of other websites using a script. It takes them a few seconds to do that. Um, and all the software is free. So it's a little bit of time and free software. The 15 billion stolen passwords can lead to account takeovers, identity theft, financial loss, business email compromise, which is what I was just talking about, the $3,500. Um, a lot of times business email compromise leads to a lot more than that. So usually they're, they're more interested in municipalities, large corporations, things like that, that tend to have um, accounts receivable and things like that, where they can get in the middle of the conversation and say, you know, this is XYZ Corp, you, you, we have invoices totaling $117,000. Can you remit payment to this address or can you wire it to this address or something like that? And that's, and, the, and they will get away with it. Um, sometimes it gets recovered, sometimes it doesn't. And then reputation loss. If, if they find out that, you know, Nawash Tech has been hit with a data breach and my accounts were compromised, especially somebody in the industry I'm in, then they're going to assume I don't know what I'm doing and I'm going to lose clients and I'm going to lose business from that. So a lot of people ask me, how long does it take to um, crack a password? So what does crack a password mean? Let's define that first. It's brute force. And what it means is I will run a program, again, freely available, that attempts a bunch of passwords on an application. So I'll say, let's say we'll use Wells Fargo again. We'll pick on Wells Fargo for a little while. They will keep trying to log into a Wells Fargo account, trying different password combinations. Now, eventually Wells, the Wells Fargo website will say something is not right and they will block it. Um, but other applications may not. I used to use, um, it's harder to do now because of the way Windows 10 requires you to log in, but it used to be, would plug a thumb drive into a computer 
boot up to that thumb drive and run a program that will crack the password of that computer within a few seconds. And then I'm able to log into the computer. This still happens with a lot of applications that don't have the resources that the big companies have. And so what happens is I can crack a password with that software, a seven character password with, within 29 milliseconds, so less than a second. An eight character password takes five hours. And then you can see it keeps going up from there. Nine characters takes five days, 10, four months, 11, 10 years, 12 characters, 200 years. I don't use anything less than 15 characters myself. And I have recommended that all my clients do the same. They don't all listen, but they've all been advised. Um, this will change too with quantum computing. So you may have heard quantum computing is coming. Google already has those resources. China has those resources. I'm sure the US has in some way or another those resources. Quantum computing is gonna change how long it takes to crack passwords. That's the bad news. The good news is passwords are starting to go away. Um, and little by little, they will. So if you use Office 365, Microsoft 365, they're starting to move away from passwords. And instead of using a password you created to log in, they will use uh, the Microsoft authentication app or some form of one-time password where they'll send you a password, you use it, and that's it. It's done. But it's going to be a while before, you know, Microsoft and Apple and those companies will probably do it sooner than later, but other companies are going to take longer. So your banks may take longer, your, your work applications may take longer, things like that might take longer to catch up. So it's important to know that the more characters you have in your password, the longer it will take to crack. So you can imagine nobody's going to want to spend 200 years trying to log into Victoria's account. And then as, as the pandemic started and people were sent home to work from home, I got a lot of calls initially. Can you help me connect back to my work computer, my work network? And most of them were using remote desktop protocols. And I can recall uh, pretty vividly, one person was sent home. They used to work for a municipality here in Connecticut. They no longer do, but they worked for a municipality here in Connecticut. Um, don't worry, it wasn't Meriden. And um, the IT department for that municipality sent him home with a link to connect back to his, his computer and it was a remote desktop protocol link. He just, all he had to do was click the link. Password was already stored in the application and he was able to connect back to his work computer. He needed help setting that up. It wasn't really much except downloading it from an email and showing him how to do it. And then I saw the password and the password was really weak. It wasn't any of these, but it was really weak password. Um, and I don't recall what it was now, but it was, I think it was six characters. So easily, and easily guessable, I think it was somebody's name or something. Um, remote desktop protocol is the default remote, des remote access program for Microsoft Windows. So if you have a server, usually it's used to connect to servers, but sometimes it's used to connect to desktops. So if you have a computer that's Windows 10 Pro or Windows Server, any addition of Windows Server, you can remote into that computer using remote desktop protocol. It's advised that you do this over VPN, virtual private network, because that then it's not done in clear text and it's a little more secure. But these were the 10 most leaked remote desktop credentials uh, last year. I think 2019 actually. The number one was one, two, three, four, five, six. People are still using that for a password. This also made the list for top 25 most used passwords of 2019. Not just remote desktop protocol, but any password. It wasn't number one. I don't remember what number one was, but it was in the top 25. People are still using this as a password. And on a lot of, if you think about it, a lot of applications won't even let you use a password that short anymore. So that's kind of scary when you think about it. One, two, three password with an at instead of a, an a and an, a zero instead of an o i uh, met a lawyer probably well it was during the election cycle and he was trying to i don't know if he succeeded or not but he was trying to get onto the joe biden team and um needed help with his email because his company 
um, broke up and, you know, each of the lawyers went their own way. So he wanted to be able to set up his email on his own computers. And so I was helping him and he told me what his password was. And it was password with an uppercase P and at, but didn't have the zero, had an O. This is a lawyer who's trying to become part of the federal government. One, two, three, four, password one. One, the number one is like, why, why put a password on it at all? The word password in all lowercase, one, two, three, four, five, admin. And then this, what looks like hexadecimal, but it's not. Um, that is the default password for some for some piece of hardware. I don't remember what it was, but it, it's the default password on that hardware. So what sometimes happens is uh, some hardware goes out with default admin password. Well, they all go out with default logins for for the hardware in some cases that admin password and username is hard coded into the hardware meaning it can't be changed well somebody eventually figures it out and then it, then all of those devices are exposed and this just happened with um a firewall company i think it was sonic wall or zyxel or someone like that had a hard coded admin username and password on all of their firewall and routers and somebody figured out what it was so now all of those devices are exposed. I can log in and change the firewall rules, allow access to all these other nasty things. So this was similar to that. I don't think it was a firewall. I don't know what it was, but it was a piece of hardware that had a default password built into it. So that is uh, a, something I'm, we're going to go over best practices in a moment, but it is something that you should change immediately. If you buy a new router at the store, whatever it is, you have firewall in your office, you get a com computers don't come with default passwords anymore, but whatever it is, change the default password. Another scenario where this sometimes happens is if I set up um, an account for a client, I'll send them the password. It's usually more complex than this, but it'll be something like change me now or something like that. And I'll tell them you need to change the password immediately. I'll try to force it even, and they won't. And they'll leave it as is, so the password never changes somebody else figures it out. So best password practices, by the way, you guys can interrupt me anytime to ask questions. Best password practices. First one is complex passwords. That means uppercase, lowercase numbers and special characters, the longer, the better. Um, again, I usually say 15 characters or more. There are two methods to managing those passwords. So the first method is using song lyrics, movie quotes, titles, things like that, and then changing some of the numbers. So you change the E to a three, change the O to a zero, things like that. Now, that's going to get confusing fast if you have you know any number of applications where you need to log into. Trying to remember all the different quotes you used and things like that, is, and where you changed out letters for numbers and added special characters. That's going to get confusing really fast. The other method is there are lots of ways to generate um, complex passwords. So further down the list, I have used password manager. So I use LastPass as a password manager. Uh, use LastPass password generator, but there are lots of If you Google password generator, you'll find one for sure. And you set the length you want to use. And then what characters you want to use. So you select both, you know, you select all uppercase, lowercase, special characters and numbers. It generates a password for you. Then you save it to LastPass or whatever. There are lots of other password managers down as well. One of those by or available as well. One of those is down right now, at least one of them. But comes with the times, I guess. I do have a question. Sure. Um, so I know Apple, when you go to start a new password or a new um, account on certain websites or whatnot, um, they do offer that password that they create. And it's a, just a bunch of different, right. I know there's dashes in it and there's uppercase, lowercase numbers and everything. Is that something that's credible to use or should you steer away from that just because your phone even could get hacked or something? Um, it's just as good as a password manager, yes, from Apple. Apple okay. tends to be a little more secure than most. Um, it was unfortunate that somebody did find a way in, but it's, if you think about it, 
iPhones have been around for what a little more than 11, 12 years now. So it took them that long to figure something out. And Apple wants something like that. The good thing is when these companies get hacked, they tend to be a lot more security minded after that fact. It's unfortunate that it has to happen that way, but it does. So then once it does happen, you're going to see they're going to tighten down even more. They, you know, there was an issue with WhatsApp and Facebook not too long ago on Apple phones. They fixed that. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that somebody figures it out. You know, there are good guys out there that do it too. They're called blue hat hackers. They, they basically paid to try to hack, you know, Apple, Google, whoever. And if they find a vulnerability, they submit it and then they get paid. And some of those guys do quite well. Uh, but sometimes there's bad guys too. I have, a, I have a question as well, Scott. Sure. On the uh, so I have some subscriptions, like for newspapers, like several mm -hmm. newspaper subscriptions, mm -hmm. and they all use the same very simple password. Oh, it's better than password. Um, mm -hmm. Does that matter? I mean, I'm not like I'm just trying to read the newspaper that I have subscription to. And I'm not I'm not thinking in terms of the password being the same as say for my LinkedIn account or my Facebook account or whatever. It's just because I want to be able to read that. I don't care if you read it; it doesn't matter to me. But, but again, is it, is it exposing something else that I wouldn't think about? It could. Um, I don't I don't know what other information they have with those newspaper subscriptions. So let's say they have your home address and, and the profile. Then at that point, you've, you've given up some of your personally identifiable information. Um, also, depending on what newspaper it is, like I know the Record Journal, I don't think they really have much else associated with the newspaper. But... If it connects to anything else, then you're exposing whatever that is as well. Um, or if there's a way for them, let's say they log in as you, and then they're able to communicate with other people on my record journal or whatever, whatever newspaper, I'm not saying that's the problem, but whatever newspaper it is, then you risk that they may start a conversation with someone and convince someone to do something they wouldn't normally do. So it happens okay. a lot on Facebook. So if 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 uh, if I use Facebook as the example, and an account gets compromised on Facebook, and then that person starts talking to me, um, they may trick me into giving them money or giving them in additional information that they need for something, um, something like that. Gotcha. All right. Malicious links, malicious documents get passed around. Yeah. Uh, don't reuse passwords. You, you must have read the next line. Don't reuse passwords. No two applications, websites, logins should have the same password. I see you smiling, Victoria. Uh, and in addition to that, you shouldn't. So if I, so after let's use LinkedIn again. After that hack, I changed my password. Obviously, once they told everybody, I should not use that password anywhere again. Now that's where it get, it can get really complicated, especially if you work for a company. You may, um, they may require you to change your password. Some companies do that. They require you to change your password every 45 days or every 90 days, something like that. Um, and what a lot of people do, they'll use the same password and they'll just change one character every 45 days. Well, then it becomes easy to figure out what it is. Once, once I get enough information, and, and I've done this on a professional level, I've done this, I've tricked people into giving me enough information to figure out either how to reset the password or get their password. Um, and that's social engineering. So it can be done. It doesn't take a lot. This was somebody who was in the same industry, you know, the, the IT industry that had enough cybersecurity knowledge. And he was tricked into giving his security questions. And through that, I was able to reset his password and gain access to his accounts. Um, Monitor and check if your info is involved in a breach. So I'm gonna stop this screen share for a moment to show you where you can do that for free. Go here. So this is the website, haveibeenpawned.com. It's, I don't know if you can see that, but it's haveibeenpwned.com. And you could check here for free. So I'm going to use my throwaway Gmail account at this point. 
And I believe this was the email account I had set up for LinkedIn, but we'll know in a second. So it tells me I've been pawned. Basically means my my e this means this email address shows up in breaches. You guys can see that, right? Okay. And it tells me there were 16 data breaches and one paste. Um, and then if you want to know what a paste is, you can come here and it tells you paste is information has been pasted to a publicly facing website designed to share content such as paste bin, meaning somebody took that information and put it on a website for everybody to see. And it's probably a password list that they can download. Um, and then it, down here, it shows me where I've been breached. So some of these I'm not 100% familiar with. So this Cito Day supposedly is a group of websites that um, had that was breached. It says 23,000 websites that were breached and that 226 million unique email addresses alongside password pairs were involved. This was back last November. Um, I don't, you know, it doesn't tell me what website it was. Maybe this does, maybe the link does, but um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what, I've never been on a site called Citadel, but so here are some of the other ones. And, and none of these look familiar to me. So that should be a, an even bigger concern because now I don't know what website it was, or if it was a website I was ever involved with. So to answer your question again, Bob, they could take your, your email and use it on a different website. And then that website gets breached. Yeah, see, it doesn't list all of them. So I don't know if mine, you know, what website it was or anything. Collection number one from January, 2019, right before the, the pandemic, this was um, 2.7 billion records. I think this one they found on a database on the web. So what does happen sometimes is those lists that I keep telling you about get uploaded to an Amazon uh, database and then left open on the internet. Oh, also this here, the data was provided to HIBP by dehashed. They take, so a lot of times the password's a hash, meaning the password, if I use password as my password, the, whatever it is I'm using to log into will hash that password. So they'll make it look like just a bunch of random characters. The problem with that is there are, there are tools out there that can dehash it. And then once it's dehashed, now everybody knows what the hash for password is because it never changes. So if I use password and you use password, the hash is the same for both of us. So now they know the hash for password is all these random characters. They're all the same for everybody. It's no longer a secure password. Um, data enrichment exposure from PDL. I don't, I don't know what that is. Um, I will tell you, these two, Vinny Troya and Bob Dechenko, are, are very well-known security researchers. So if they say it's a problem, it's a problem. Here you have Dropbox. So in 2012, Dropbox was compromised. My email address was attached to Dropbox at that time. And um, they got email addresses and passwords. So if you were using Dropbox in 2012, they were compromised. Evany was a, an online game that I used to play. I don't have time for that anymore, but they were compromised. Email address, IP address, passwords, usernames. IP address means they could potentially figure out where you live or where you work. Exploit.in is an Indian site. I'm not sure how my information wound up there, but there is a huge list of email addresses and passwords there. JE, JE fit or JFIT, I'm not sure. I know I remember, I think I tried to use it, but I don't think I ever did. Mail.ru, Russian mail site, but supposedly they got some Gmail accounts in there somehow. And supposedly Bitcoin was involved. I've never I have Bitcoin, but only because I open an account with someone. Um, fitness Pal, My Fitness Pal. I use that a lot. They were February 2018, they were breached. There's a spam list going around. Park Mobile, that was a more recent one, March of this past year, this year. Park Mobile. So if you used an app, to park in like Hartford. I know some parking lots in Hartford use it. 
they have your email address, license plate, name, password, and phone number. License plate's pretty dangerous. Um, River City Media spam. I'm not sure what that is. Special K. So all of these things, and LinkedIn's not even on here. So I wasn't even using LinkedIn with this account. Actually, I think I know which account it was. And then the last one, Zynga. Those Zynga, I don't think it is on Facebook anymore, but it used to be tied to Facebook. If you played online games, you were potentially breached there. So if I put in my work email, it should, yeah, good. Because it was last week. <laughs> it's still green. Now, that's not to say that my Gmail account is insecure, unless, of course, I'm using the same password for my Gmail account. Um, it's saying that my information is showing up on the dark web and, and was involved in breaches. And there are, are a number of other breaches out there that uh, all the time uh, or buckets of data that show up on the Internet all the time with this information. Um, there was one not too long ago that popped up. And I was at a networking group and the, the group was majority majority women who like to shop online and it was Hotlook or Hotlook. I'm not sure how you say it, but it's H-A-U-T-E-L-O-O-K. That was 2020. They were breached and about half of the people in the networking group, oh my God, I use that site. Um, but it happens all the time. And th those are those are sometimes credit card breaches. So we talked earlier this morning, Victoria, you were there when we talked about the credit card skimmers at the gas stations. It's the same idea. They, they will skim the, the e-commerce sites using JavaScript and steal credit card information. Um, that happens. This is a free site. You can use it as often as you want. Um, there's another one, but there's, a, there's actually quite a few that out there, but there's um, other things you could check too. There's ha have I... I think it's have I been Emotet, but Emotet is dead, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then there's an application you can install on your computer, SpyBot Identity Monitor. That is also free. That will, if you can put in your email addresses and just open it periodically to check to see if you show up in new breaches. But I would definitely check. Can you repeat that one one more time? It is SpyBot. SpyBot. Hold on. SpyBot Identity Monitor. No, it's not showing me. We do have a little bit of a crowd at the chamber, so oh, <laughs> it's not I didn't just know. me, it's a couple of us listening. And we're all do, uh, really taking lots of notes here, Scott. Yes. Well, hello, everyone. <laughs> <clears throat> so, yeah, this is good. This is really important. And you can sign up um, for them to monitor proactively. I don't know what that looks like as far as costs, but... And then there's a link to one password here, but I use LastPass. All right, back to presentation. Uh, your credit card companies will also monitor to a, to a degree. So if you have, um, I don't know, I think like Capital One or Citibank or any of those, Chase, they monitor and they will alert you to any potential breaches. Supposedly, Google Chrome will now tell you if you use their password manager that you've been, um, that your password is weak or involved in a breach. I have not seen that, so I don't know if it works, but supposedly it does. Use multi-factor authentication. So this is a big one. Um, multi-factor authentication is things like one-time passwords, thumbprints, uh, retina scans, facial recognition, things like that, um, RFID cards, an additional form of authentication to say you are who you are. In some companies, they will even use geolocation. So they'll say, you know, Bob is where he's supposed to be, and he's using the right password, and he's using the one-time password, we can let him in. The VA does this. Um, most For most small businesses, you're going to end up using multi-factor authentication using a one-time password. So what that means is you install an app, you install an app on your phone, is Microsoft Authenticator, Google Authenticator, and Authy are the big three. And I think LastPass does offer one as well. Um, and then you set up uh, the whatever it is you're logging into, the application, the website, your email, whatever it is and say you want to turn on multi-factor authentication, you'll most times scan a QR code 
that'll generate a code on your phone. And then you put the phone, the code back into that application and then it syncs and now it matches up. So now when you go to log in, it'll ask you for that one-time password, passcode. You'll put in your username, you'll put in your, your, your static password, and then you'll put in your one-time password. The app on your phone will generate the one-time password. That one-time password changes every 30 seconds. So it's never the same. Um, and that's the additional layer of, of um, security, the additional layer of authentication to protect you, which will actually prevent most of the time if you put up that extra roadblock, whoever's trying to break into your accounts is just going to walk away. They're going to give up. They're looking for the low-hanging fruit. If your fruit doesn't hang lower than somebody else's, they're probably not going to grab it. Um, so multi-factor authentication would prevent most of the, the HIPAA breaches I've seen would have been prevented if that was set up. Not to so say it's foolproof. It's definitely not, but it is a lot more secure than not having it. So that one-time password is like when you go to log into, for example, in college, they had us log into Microsoft Office. Mm -hmm. And then you would put in your regular password. I mean, is your password still safe if you're using the same one, but you're doing the two-step verification or no? It's safer than without the two-step verification. But if you're reusing that password, I would change it. Okay. Um, change a lot. Also... <laughs> You can set it up with SMS text messaging. That is not as secure as the application because of SIM swapping, which is another big issue out there. And what happens is, and it was just, you probably all heard about the T-Mobile breach that just occurred again. Um, they could potentially steal your phone number. And if, if they were successful in doing that, they steal your phone number, then they're getting all your text messages. So now anything that you log into and that sends you a text message with a, but a code is now at risk. So how do you how do you get this uh, uh, like rather than doing the uh, I mean I know sometimes I get an email rather than a text message. Yep. But even then I mean I feel like at that point I'm at risk too. So what's another option to do a, another step that's a verification? Yeah, the risk is always there. It's the more security you put on top of it to lower your risk to answer your question um if you can if you can get a, i know some like twitter not that long ago was only doing it through text they just recently changed it and now they've actually added um keys private uh, private keys private key pairs i should say and so that's even more secure but it's also a pain to manage for a bunch of websites um some websites still only do text messaging, but the majority of them will say, do you want to set up a text messaging? Do you want to set up with a, with a path, with a authentication application like Microsoft Authenticator or Google Authenticator? Uh, so most of them will offer that now and you just have to choose that option. You can also do the one-time password through email, which is still a little bit more secure, not much more, but a little bit more secure than text messaging because even if they steal your phone number, they're not going to have access to your email. They're just going to have access to your phone number. Um, and some, like Slack does it that way. I don't know if you if you use Slack at all, but Slack does it. So Slack is a community, it's similar to Teams. And um, they, don't, they don't do passwords. They send you a one-time password, and then you log in with that. Use the password manager. So I mentioned it a few times. LastPass is, is what I use. Um, most of my clients that use password managers use LastPass, but there are other ones out there. LastPass does have a free plan for personal use. Um, and even their business plans are not that expensive. Um, there's one password, there's uh, a bunch of other websites that do one, one that's down right now is I2 Glue, but that's more for companies like mine to manage people's passwords. Um, then you could also, if you're not comfortable with a, a website, which I get, you know, what happens if that, that website gets hacked. Um, you can also use an application. There's a, a bunch of them out there. There's KeePass is the one that I'm most familiar with. And that's spelled K-E-E -E pass. And you can install that on your computer and save all your passwords locally. And then, you know, if you use LastPass, then all you have to do is remember one password. Make that nice and secure. And then everything else is secure. 
and then turn on multi-factor authentication in there too. Uh, stop oversharing. So this is a, uh, and you're probably going to start to figure out why I asked that question in the beginning. Stop oversharing. I see Facebook posts all the time that ask, what was your first concert? Um, you know, if you, how far away do you live from the town you live in? Or how far away do you live from the town you were born in? Sound familiar? Um, things like that. Oh, I had a poll I was supposed to put up too, but I didn't. Um, they ask you these questions and I get it. They're fun games. You want to participate. You want to share your stuff with your, with other people, but these are social engineering scams. And no, the person sharing it is not trying to social engineer you, but somebody is trying to social engineer people to get enough information to be able to try to compromise the account. Um, these are often security question answers. So what was the name of your first pet or what school did you go to when you were a kid or things like that? Or uh, where were you born was a, a very common one. Uh, and I, so I purposely answered that wrong, by the way. The problem is when I need to reset the password, I don't remember what wrong answer I used, but I purposely answered those wrong. Um, you know, your favorite movie, things like that. What, those are the kind of things that, that social engineers are using to try to get enough information to be able to compromise your account or to, to potentially hack you. Hacking humans, it's a real thing. This happens a lot on social media, primarily Facebook, but I've seen it on Twitter. I've seen it on LinkedIn. I have seen posts where they will say, and I, I tried this, but it didn't work, but I've seen other people try it and it worked. They will say, this is amazing. You can't comment your password in the comments. And people will actually put their passwords in the comments. Don't use personal info in your passwords. That, so you don't use your name, your kids' names, your family name, uh, your job info, your company name, your favorite sports team, family info, birth dates, all of those things. And don't use passwords in browsers and apps. I worked with a CPA last week, and they had a bunch of passwords and usernames stored in Google Chrome. It is three steps to be able to uncover passwords in Google Chrome. You go to the settings, go to auto login, and all the password usernames and passwords are listed there that you've saved to Google Chrome. And all I got to do is, is click the little eyeball that shows me the password. That's all it takes. So now if somebody gains access to your computer, that's one of the first things they do. They grab that from Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Firefox, whatever browser you're using. So don't store them in there. Don't store them in the apps that you use. It makes, I know it makes it easier. It's great because you don't have to click, you just click log in and you're in, but it's extremely insecure. And it doesn't take much to, if I download a Word document that opens up a, a macro or a script to pull all that information and send it to someone else. Matter of seconds. So let's talk about how far do you how far away do you live from where you were born? I have seen this social media, this question is floating around on social media now for a few weeks. And so let's say I say I live, I live in Holyoke, Mass, and I say I, I live 20 minutes away or 20 miles away from where I was born. I can search my name on, on Google right now and see where I currently live would probably maybe I see a couple of old addresses, but I get an idea of where I live, right? And so if it shows that I live in Holyoke and it's 20 miles from where I live is where I was born, then I can deduce pretty, pretty um confidently that I was born in Springfield, right? That's enough to answer security questions. That's enough to get more information. Um if you give, if you get phone calls that they, they, you know, you pick up, they say, can we speak to Scott Gumbar? And you say, this is Scott. And they say, can you verify the last four of your social? Don't. I've gotten that call. And they say, well, in order to continue this conversation, we need to verify the last four of your social. And I say, well, then we can't continue this conversation. Because if they know approximately when I was born and where I was born, they already have the rest of my social security number. All they need is the last four. Um, 
these are the kind of things that, the, you know, the, it may seem innocent. You know, what is your favorite movie? We all want to share our favorite movie. I want to share quotes from my favorite movie. I want to share song lyrics, but they're, these are all social engineering skills, social engineering techniques to get more information about you. And they may be trying to get information out of you to, to harm you in some way. They may be getting, trying to get information out of you to try to harm somebody else close to you. I've seen Facebook accounts hacked, not for the purpose of hacking the person to hack, but to try to get somebody else on that friends list, to get to somebody else on that friends list. I've seen that happen. Um, it does happen. So you have to be careful with what information you share. The other thing I would say is it's kind of older, so you probably already knew this, but if you're on vacation, um, the, the vacation autoresponders are dangerous. So I would always, always say set those up for only the people that need to know it. I only tell my clients that I'm going to be away and that's it. I don't set up autoresponders. And then if you're going to post pictures from your vacation, wait till you get back. Because if you're telling people you're away, you're telling people that your, your job might be less secure at that point. You're telling people that your home might be less secure at that point. There, there's a chance that they can, they have, now they have time to do what they need to do. If you listen to any of the uh, cybersecurity podcasts, you'll hear that theme a lot. That's how the, um, there are teams that do social engineering professionally to find weaknesses within a company. They're hired to break into the company essentially. And that, they do this a lot. So they'll, they'll find out, you know, CFO of the company is out on vacation and they'll use that to get into the company. It happens a lot. Um, so if I'm, t if I'm asking you how far away do you live from where you were born and you answer, you know, 30 miles and I know where you live now, or I can get a pretty good idea of where you live now, I can probably figure out where you're born because there's hospitals are only in major cities for the most part. I definitely made it very easy on your part then because I did put my answer in the chat. Your answer was kind of vague though. I saw the answer. Where did it go? I did this. <laughs> you guys actually did better because I did this with, with a bunch of lawyers and I got more answers. Mm. We live in the city we were born in. So I don't know where you were born. I could look it up, but I don't, I'm sure I can okay. figure it out with enough. There are tools designed to do just that. They're called open source information gathering and from open source intelligence is what they're called. And websites dedicated to this. You go to this website, you put in some information and it, it will spit out whatever it can find. Um, so I could probably do a little bit of work and find out where you were born and where you live. But why make it easy? I mean, you could probably figure out where I was born too if you did a little bit of work, but I'm not going to make it easy for sure. Um, you know, so that's it. That's all I have for you today. I'm, you know, if you have questions, throw them at me. Go ahead. You're good. Scott, you had said that the... <clears throat> If you go to these, I've been pawned spots mm -hmm. that they let you know about your email address that's been pawned. What if, so if the email address is pawned, does that necessarily mean that the password has been pawned? And if you change your password, is it okay then? Yeah. So the email, if the email address is on the list, that means your that email account was involved in a breach. So I'm going to, I'll keep using the LinkedIn one as an example, because that was a big one. So if your email account was attached to your LinkedIn account when it was hacked, then they have your email address, they have your password, they have the password you were using at that time. Okay. So they, they don't have the new password if you change it. Um, they, let, me, let me see if I can figure out what other information they had, but they had, because um, I, I think I remember what email address I was using now. Um, but they have all that information and depending on the breach that will tell you whether or not they have password or, or whatever it was. Um, let me see if I can, yeah, here it is. LinkedIn, May, 2016. So just a little, a little more than five years ago, 164 million email addresses and passwords. Oh, it was actually a hacked in 2012, but they found out in 2016. Those passwords are being offered for sale even four years later. So they're still up for sale on the dark web. 
But if you change your password, then you're okay. You change your password, then your LinkedIn account is okay. But if you use that password anywhere else, they will then try, they will take that password and your email account that, so I've changed both on LinkedIn since then. Okay. But they will take that combination and try it against other websites to see if, if it does open. Um, as an example, you may remember, I think last year, there was a big thing about how ring cameras were not safe and yeah. people were breaking into ring cameras. Yeah. Well, they weren't really breaking into ring cameras. They were using password, username and password combinations that they found on the internet and trying them against ring cameras. And especially if you, so ring cameras are somewhat public because I can share my video out to my neighborhood, right? Yeah. So if somebody has that information and then they try the email and pass, email address and password on, that, on a ring camera, a login and see what comes up, it's because I use that same combination somewhere else. And that, that somewhere else was involved in a breach and they're gonna keep trying. So they found that worked, okay, what else works? right um the one thing so ring cameras owned by amazon the one thing i will say that amazon did wrong with that is they should have forced people to use multi-factor authentication on that okay so i got a question for you as well scott so on the because you mentioned the ring camera you have the internet of things kind of okay. project that product out there yeah. where you have something that internet uh, um whatever enabled and they have passwords. So you're theoretically what you're saying is we should have passwords for everything that we have as access to the internet and have two, two, two factor authorization. Yeah. Anything that's going to wow. get on the internet because an IOT devices are notoriously less secure than our computers and our phones because we don't pay as much attention to them. So I may have a nest. I don't, but I may have a nest thermostat in my house and those have been compromised so many times. And, and it's because people don't think about it when they're thinking about how can people access my network or my home? You know, there, there was, I, I wish I could find it now. There was a business that was hacked through a um, aquarium thermostat that was connected to the internet. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Thanks. Yep. I, I might know. have mentioned it to you. Oh, sorry, Scott. We I might have mentioned it to you last week, or and when when we were promoting this program um, through different areas, we actually did have not. This is honestly the truth. We did have somebody call um, this poor woman last week, panicking. Um, she actually was in like the East Lime area. She called us here at the chamber. She was just uh, beside herself, looking for help and advice. She was apartment searching or something and um, apparently gave up her bank routing number and mm -hmm. account number for like a down payment for an apartment. And I don't think the company even existed. So, you know, she was just like in tears really. And, um, you know, so we suggested she, you know, A, call the police and report it and, you know, certainly uh, get in contact with her bank uh, immediately and, and uh, you know, the credit reporting agencies. But, you know, it is happening everywhere. And Yeah, that's actually a, a very common scam, believe it or not, unfortunately. And it, it, the, the real estate world is a big target. The business email compromise scams I talked about earlier, the $3,500 scam happens a lot in real estate. They will get law firms to wire the money to the wrong account. Happens a lot. And so much so that they've actually added extra steps for lawyers now to do the closings. Oh. Yeah. But that is a common scam. They will, they will claim they're out of state and... You know, you could go look at the house or the apartment. I've I've seen they happen a lot on Craigslist, actually. Yeah. Well, you gave us some great tips as always here, Scott, and I'm I'm glad you recorded it because again, this is just valuable, valuable information for everybody. I think we all have a story to tell. Again, whether it's somebody calling here at the chamber for advice or something personal, a family member, a friend. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it's happening and, you know, we appreciate, um, you know, you providing this great information for us. And um, again, I'm glad we recorded it so that we can share it, you know, with, with others and so that they can be a little bit more protected as well. Yeah. And if anybody, if you just have a general question, I don't have any problem answering questions at all. I, I, I really don't want to see people get scammed so much so that I do plan on starting something along those lines, how to teach people how not to get scammed um, because it, they're out there. And, and as you know, we have another one planned for November for phishing scams because the holidays are coming. I'm already seeing the emails. It's already started. The end of August, they started. So they're going to come. They're going to come. You're going to get emails from, you know, Amazon, not really Amazon, but Amazon, Best Buy, companies like that, that will say, hey, uh, you know, you have a thousand dollar gift card. I, the one I got was, and somebody I know fell for this. You purchased this TV on Amazon. Um, click here to see the invoice. You did not purchase a TV on Amazon. If you don't <laughs> think you did, you didn't. Um, so just, you know, send me an email. You can, that's, that's one of my email addresses at the bottom there, support at nawaj.tech where you can follow us on social media. I share some of that stuff all the time. Um, but if you just have a general question, email, call, whatever. Yep. Great. I'm going to change my 200 passwords now to 200 <laughs> different passwords. Use, use, um, use last pass. It'll help you out. Yeah. Or something similar. Yeah. I will definitely keep that in mind. I was already thinking of, getting a little notebook and just writing it all down. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. So that's another one I I had of uh, I've had um a client tell me his previous IT person said, "No, just keep all your passwords on a notebook, in a notebook and keep that with you." Well, what happens if you drop that notebook? Mm -hmm. And you've lost access to everything and somebody else now has access to everything. Okay. Yeah, don't do that. Use use an application and there's always risk involved. So you have to pick the one with the least amount of risk. The password yeah. managers have the least amount of risk. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Whew. That's scary. <laughs> yeah. Pretty. You you would I, I should do one of these on just all the bad advice I've heard. Because there's a lot of <laughs> awesome. We'll add that to the list. Yeah. Scott. So thank you everyone. Appreciate your thank time. Thank you.